The, the book we're looking at tonight is a culmination of really two stories. The, the first one is improvements in astral projection and out-of-body consciousness. And the second area is actually turning that into something useful and starting to make contact with other worlds and record what life is like in those locations. It's not that difficult in principle for everyone to find out what life on other worlds is like because everyone gathered in this room will in some latent way have past lifetime memories of living on other planets with other family members. So if someone put you under hypnosis or got you into a very relaxed state, they would be able to discover a greater history and heritage behind what you're experiencing now. The big step forward in this was improving astral projection enough to make this possible. And I'll give a little bit of a background of what I mean by that. Many of you will be familiar with the works of people like Robert Monroe, who talked about out-of-body consciousness and getting your body to slip out and go and visit other places. For the most part, the way he taught that was a function of going to sleep. So if you lay on your bed very quietly and got your body to fall asleep, you could get your consciousness to come out of body and perhaps find a similar reality of your bedroom or step out into another world outside of that. For anyone who's succeeded in doing that, it's quite fun. I know personally when I tried those kinds of techniques, I could get out of body and to test it, I used to practice jumping out of my bedroom window or something like that, just to test the drop and not killing myself on the way down was a lovely proof, yes, I'd made it out of body because it was all a bit of fuzzy. But the difficulty with that kind of approach is that you can get out of body, but you don't really meet anyone or anything terribly useful most of the time. And, and a lot of people have done this out of body consciousness, but they don't do it reliably, and they tend not to meet any sort of guiding spirits of that sort. So I personally practiced this for many years and got a little bit of help in relaxation techniques until one day I was able to get out of body in an awake enough state. I did bump into a guiding spirit who in a very, uh, shall we say, symbolic way asked me to sit on a bench beside him. I think he was that side of me as the best I recall those early days. And this guiding spirit then focused on teaching me the telepathy for yes and no, which was the basic starting point of the universal communications language. And from that, I was then able to build up a relationship with various guiding spirits, and they were able to teach me more about astral projection and how you get your consciousness out there into the spirit world. This then turned into teaching other people how to do the same thing and doing it in quite a reliable way. Uh, so, for example, I was able to meet my future children and a vision of my future wife, who unfortunately wasn't the girl I was going out with at the time. So she uh, got elbowed by the vision it had to be said. The vision of future wife explained how to deal with not to, the wrong mother for the children. So all of this was taught and other people I was working with could also see uh, my future children, future wife, they'd learn to see all of their guiding spirits. What happened next was, in the development of this, we then had a bit of a close encounter situation where one night I was lying in bed and felt as if my body was being hollowed out by sort of unknown characters. And, and I ended up huddled up in a little ball, shivering and shaking, just getting frozen from the inside out. And, and I leant across, you might say, to a guiding spirit I was working with to say, is this all right, mate? Because last time I experienced anything like this, these are near-death experiences. If you feel cold to the bones inside like that, a lot of your spirit body is leaving. Well, in this case, it seems to be getting scooped out by something. And the guiding spirit beside me said, well, this is okay, you'll be all right. And, and I just tolerated this more and more huddling up into a little fetal ball like that. 
and cold to the bones until I suddenly got the impression, not only was I lying in bed, but there was a duality going on. It was as if I was sitting on a bench somewhere in another room and someone was in front of me putting their fingers in front of my face going, can you see? Can you, can you observe? Are you okay? And, and at that point I realized that there was a kind of portal of some sort, a link with another world happening at that moment where some being in another location was endeavoring to make contact through the David being. And, and at this point the cold experience went into reverse. I started to experience, I was getting warmer again, but I still had a link to this other world. And what had occurred was that if you look in the book, in the first chapter of the book, there's a particular race of alien beings. They'd managed to create a link across to my body where I was sharing consciousness with one of their numbers. So from this, uh, heat returned to my body uh, and after about an hour or so I was able to go back to sleep quite normally. But after a, a few days I found that doing astral projection work with clients, taking them to uh, faraway worlds, had got quite a lot easier. It could be done before, but after this it got easier to do. So if I was working with someone one-to-one, -one, it was possible to sit down with people, teach them how to breathe properly, teach them how to uh, sense, first of all, the lovely nature spirits and forces around them, teach them to notice their own more earthly guiding spirits. And then at that point, if they wanted to, you could start to get contact with other alien races and beings out there. And from this, it was possible to build up a sort of research program of practicing with people and showing them how personally to link with other worlds and get their own individual experience. And as this built up, we found we were linking into many different species and races and it was possible to create an encyclopedia of sorts of some of the beings we'd met. So instead of it just being one person on their own trying this, this was a group project to go and link with other worlds and start to document it. And as we did this, a much bigger picture of humanity's existence started to build up. It became apparent that we are uh, merely one of a greater family, but we're in the odd position at the moment that a lot of our memory of those other worlds is taken away. You can get it in hypnotic regression, but the step forward is to try and do this more consciously and try and connect to those memories of other worlds through just doing meditation practices or better breathing practices that give you astral projection ability. You can link into them, you can start to find friends and family in other worlds. We therefore found that whilst there are many advanced beings in the universe who are happily communicating with each other telepathically and know of each other quite well, they see us on Earth as actually part of their family, part of a group of beings where their friends are coming to Earth and experiencing relatively primitive bodies in order that you might try and bring some love and light into this world. To put another spin on this one, see it as if you personally have chosen to be in this world in this time in order that you might have the opportunity to help other human beings connect to more of these advancements and more of these advancing techniques. And to go into the context of advancing techniques, Watkins Bookshop is a wonderful place for picking up old techniques that have been re reinvented. There's wonderful books on old subjects, but there's relatively little new technology in that. If you look at what's being done, many books are concentrating what has gone on years before and people in ancient temples in the East have managed to achieve. What we're getting now, with the new consciousness coming through from our greater family in the rest of the universe, are more advances in these techniques that actually take us forward. 
So we're seeing new approaches. We're actually seeing new ways of understanding the human energy system and a new understanding of what you are personally. To go into this as well, some people have a very nervous attitude towards alien beings. For example, reptilians are identified as a bunch of nasty characters who come here, prod around with weak-minded human beings, and thus manage to cause a lot of chaos. In the book, uh, they were a group that we wanted to have a look in early on to see what they were up to and get things from their perspective. Uh, and in their world, it was a very hierarchical society, rather like an Indian caste system, where people would get born into particular roles in life. So they had more mundane physical worker types, and at the other end of the extreme, they had more intellectuals. They had very artistic people. And at the upper end of their society was a bunch of people who thought that teasing human minds was a good laugh and would be quite entertaining. So they saw this as a bit of fun, and if they could prod human beings in a amusing for them way, they would do it. And if human beings didn't notice this, that was their lookout. As far as they were concerned, this was a bit of fun. In other sorts of beings we found, there were many species of different greys coming in different shapes and forms. The grey aliens are basically a sort of insect design that has been repeated on many worlds. For example, human beings apparently are a design that's been repeated also in many worlds, but grown from scratch, as if basic DNA has been manipulated and nudged along in particular directions to get the sorts of results you see here today. So going out there, you will find many other species of human-like beings who also have been grown from first principles, you could say. Going back to the grain characters, another feature about them that's worth noticing is they're fundamentally insects, which demonstrates on Earth uh, insects many billions of years ago were one of the, sorry, many millions of years ago were one of the top species but uh, uh, for whatever reason, they weren't really chosen to go forward. But on other planets, you will find various insect species going forward. And when you're astrally projecting to their worlds, you can experience being their bodies. Uh, and one of the things you have to watch out for is the different way they breathe. So, for example, many insect races breathe through the sides of their bodies. And you have to attune your energy system into that in order to be able to experience those worlds and experience what their bodies, thoughts and lives are like. So we get to go around in quite a different selection of worlds by this technique. You'll also find at, uh, I wouldn't quite call it the upper echelons, but some of the higher dimension beings seem to spend their days working on universe building, planet building. And, and they then allow their numbers to go and experience living in worlds like this. So the world we're experiencing right now seems to be very much an engineered environment where other beings have put it together and then their numbers included in us have come down here to drop into this world and start to experience these sorts of things personally. So it's rather like saying you're in an advanced world, now see how you do down on Earth. And there is quite a difference in the sort of experience and life it's like. On most of these other more advanced worlds, telepathy is very natural. Uh, what you feel and how you express your emotions is a major part of any conversation. Some beings don't bother with spoken language at all because that's very fluid and it's easy to connect to. On this earthly level at the moment, using telepathic skills is relatively difficult you'll find there's a tremendous amount of confusion, you'll run into a lot of static, and you'll also experience other people's upset emotions, which knocks you about. So it's quite fun to actually experience what smoother running worlds are like, to realize sometimes how rough it is on Earth, how difficult it can be down here, and to accomplish any sort of spiritual, practical advancement is quite an achievement, because you're up against it a lot of the time but at least people are moving forward. They do come in quite a few shapes and sizes, and there are so many alien beings in this universe out there. 
The encyclopedia we've done here only captures a small number of them. But uh, the, yeah, the fifty children were yeah. people said, oh, it was imagination, but when they are fifty years old. Uh, yeah. field. When this little ship arrived, they walked out and they yeah. came on. Uh, I'm inclined to believe that there are other people who visit us from outer space one way or the other. That's as far as yeah. my knowledge goes. These sorts of things are, are very common. It does happen a lot. For example, if you look at people like the Mayan races, you'll find a lot of alien-inspired art getting into all their work. So it's quite, it's quite a, a normal thing. But visiting aliens tend to do it very tentatively in most cases. They don't like landing somewhere like the middle of Trafalgar Square and then waving a few flags and saying, take us to your political leader of the day. <laughs> they much prefer dropping down in remote locations. And very often, the people they're visiting have some higher connection with them at a soul level, it would be part of their friends and family that they're actually visiting. So, in respect to children like that, whilst it would be a bit much to say all of those children had some predetermined plan to meet up with them, it's very likely that at a soul level, many of those children would have been looking forward to that life-changing experience and wanted to have that connection because it will certainly flip them round. Mm. Right. What more thoughts and um, I'm just wondering, um, <coughs> there was an incident in uh, Iberia in 1917 <coughs> when uh, a, a lady appeared to three school children in 1917. Yeah. And she uh, more or less declared herself to be the Virgin Mary on that type of parallel. Yeah. And she appeared all together about three or four times. And on the last occasion, she was witnessed by up to about a crowd of 50,000. Um, taken that she appears to come out of the past, yeah. on some sort of time level, how does this equate what you're saying about someone coming from space? So, would you have a comment on that? So, so your question is for a comment about how, how and sort of there's an advance happening at the moment. Am I getting your question right? Because I have to repeat this back to the camera. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is that uh, this mysterious visitor, she declared herself as a lady from heaven. Yes. Um, not, nothing more, nothing less. Um, but it would appear that uh, the children that she, that, that she appeared to, to there were only about eight or nine, three of them. Yeah. Um, they perceived her as a, a saint. You know, yes. That, and who came from heaven. And so she's coming out of a religious mythology that belongs to the past. She clear, well, she clearly wasn't coming from outer space. Well, it's debatable whether she was coming from outer space, but you see my point that it appears to be someone doing the travel of time, yeah. not of space, is what, what you're indicating. Well, I just make sure I get that question right then. What we're saying is there are many beings coming uh, visiting from the heavens, that's quite normal. It, this is a regular place to visit. Uh, uh, mostly when you bump into them, they're quite a modest bunch. <laughs> uh, and they don't necessarily regard themselves uh, as very saintly. But most of the beings who visit here uh, come from worlds where the dimensions are a bit higher, and that of itself tends to make their auras tend to glow a bit brighter. So especially children who would be more clairvoyantly aware, they would tend to pick up the auric glow of any visiting being. It's certainly the case that uh, religions and groups can then hijack this sort of event and turn it into something that it originally wasn't. You know, I should say that one, the, the elder of the three girls, yeah. uh, I think Lucia Santos was her name, she did eventually go into a convent and she never emerged out of it. And she never really revealed what uh, this being had uh, told her. Yes. But I mean, it's probably one of the most authentic examples of something visiting the Earth yes. from another dimension. Yes. I mean, it, it's historically witnessed by 50,000. And it also, when you'd get an experience like that, it would so affect your being that if you had a conversation with someone, 
they would then think perhaps the men in white coats and a straitjacket would be the way forward. <laughs> so we're now transcending into an era where technically it's possible for any interested person to get their astral projection skills up to speed and their clairvoyant skills working and start to see these beings and interact with them and then have conversations with other people about it. We've come into a wonderful transition where this all gets achievable, which is very different from the period you were referring to when that original contact happened. When you were talking earlier about uh, your experience of feeling like an alien or some being had entered your body, yeah. and you were talking about actually doing the same. Yes. The only discomfort I have around that is, was the, is that by invitation? Is that part of by invitation? I think the spirit. Yes. There's some. Yes. There's an importance that, that is invited. Yes. Uh, there are really two forms of invitation that seem to operate. Uh, one is where people have no conscious memory of it, and where there's no conscious memory of uh, wanting to interact with alien beings, if it happens this can be very unpleasant and very distressing because it would feel like you're under attack. And having done the research for the book and put it together, I then had the opportunity to meet with people who've done uh, physical alien encounters. And they, they indeed found these things could be a bit disturbing or disjointing. So if it's happened in an unconscious way that some kind of arrangement has been uh, preset, then you, you probably wouldn't like it a lot of the time. You might wish for it to end. Well, it's 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 yeah. a bit of an invasion. But the flip, it could be an invasion too. That's how it be perceived. But the flip side of the other alternative is if you're interested in this sort of subject and want to know more, there are plenty of uh, beings out there who are certainly happy to actually say hello to you. Uh, and to give you a bit of analogy, it's rather as if. Uh, some kindly person might pick you up as if you were a little puppy or kitten uh, and do a few things with you so you could have that experience, that shared experience of what their world was like and then very nicely they put you back down again and try not to disturb you too much. So they, that's when they, they're in your being? They, they, you're, they're experiencing your human body and you are experiencing their particular You're body. You're still there in your consciousness. Yes. So there's a swapping that goes on and afterwards they're very good at letting go of most of that. It's also a very helpful point to make in all of this is that the bodies we're experiencing right now are really engineered vehicles in lots of ways. There's a lot of genetic engineering that seems to have gone to have got them into this state. Uh, and furthermore, the personality and character that you live through is also something that at a higher level you've developed over many lifetimes and adopted piece by piece and brought it into this world. So you've got this whole body, this engineered vehicle, and the real essence of what you are has no personality to speak of. It's a very light, refined entity. So you are living through an engineered personality, through an engineered body, in this strange environment. But the veil of that can be lifted. This body is giving you a constant impression that you're a human alive on Earth. It tells you you've got jobs to do, it gives you memories of past events. But in a strange way, you're a visitor to it in the now. And if you simply get the body breathing nicely and energizing itself in a stable way, it can snap out of that and it starts to notice a greater reality. It begins to notice where it actually is. And at that point, then you can start to look into other worlds. So realize this, this swapping around bodies and vehicles is actually not so unnatural. You're just living in an era where people are only start to doing it more smoothly and in a less unpleasant way for the first time. So it's a great time to be alive. Finally, what more? Yes. Right. Like everyone in this room, really, there was background interest in this subject from a small boy. So, always 
uh, curious about these things, sometimes dabbling with skills. For example, learning how to uh, work with the pendulum, things like that. Seeing what you could predict in life, what you couldn't predict. Just playing around with this. It went on and on. Uh, around the 90s, there was a sea change in all, all of this when I finally managed to get together uh, some books on astral projection work and did manage a few basic uh, projections and a few things. In a similar capacity, uh, I wanted to know, could I remember any sort of past life? Uh, and to do this, I, I just need to sort of demonstrate on someone. I got lucky. <laughs> you point to me. I got lucky <laughs> in that I lay on my bed, was trying to see, could I remember anything? And the answer was yes. It was like someone was chopping my head off with an axe or some big object. It was like, bang, lights out. Like you uh, that had the effect that for about the next decade, if anything came near my head, I jumped. So that was an example of sort of DIY experimenting with this. If I'd had some proper training, it would have all gone a bit more smoothly. But anyway, it, it got some of these skills, it got some basic astral projection going, and uh, learnt what it was like to fall out of my body, uh, sometimes not bring it all back, and hence have the experience of being extremely cold afterwards uh, and unable to reheat until I'd recovered the rest of my spirit. And a lot of these sort of mistakes and general accidents went on until I got some training in just how to relax and, and do a bit of better breathing and sit down. And when I got that, I then found I got a decent link with a guiding spirit companion who was waiting for me to finally get the basics right. And some proper training was taken over. So it was trained from the heavens. So that was... What's that? Well, when you I just say, the question there was, do I think the spirit that was training me was a part of me? As you get into this work, your sense of self gets chopped up until there's not much of it left. Uh, initially, we have a sense... We have a sense of self, I'm the human being, I live, I die, and I hope I go somewhere afterwards. That's where we start off with. After a while, you begin to realize this human vehicle is very open to a large number of beings. And uh, some of them are lower spirit entities that give us basic functions. A very good example is sexual energy. Uh, sexual energy is driven by a lot of lower spirit forms. Uh, it's probably one of the most fun energies and probably the, one of the greatest nuisances at the same time, which is why people interested in spiritual development often say celibacy is the way to go, but then we'd have no children. <laughs> so you start to notice there are all these beings who are contributing to what you are. And, and as you go up and up in the system, instead of finding uh, multiple souls and that's the end of it. You can go beyond that and you find one central consciousness that is driving all the lives we're living and experiencing. So really we're all one, we are all connected at a higher level, we're all ultimately the same being, but on the way down it's got split into many different entities and people who can perform these sorts of functions. So we have different characters and thus this conversation happens. So quite where one of the starts and the next person ends, it is very difficult to say. Uh, and as to who is I and who is the next I, it's a little bit artificial, but it's something we will experience down at this level. Is that answering your question? Or was that an aspect of me? Oh, no, it's just when you come across such an academic. Sorry, what? You come across so academic that it's kind of strange that you can use the whole world, you know, of spirit. It's yeah. like you just happen to fall into it. You just no, it's... You just seem to have been definitely looking for a long time. That's why I just feel like, uh, uh, you know, there's a part of you, somewhere else, that is trying to it, help us get to where you are. It's been accessed through this body. This body came from a background of mechanical things and engineering, of just practical fixing stuff and making things work, dealing with wires and pipes and engines. What was done then 
was his body was trained to see this otherwise very esoteric spirit world in uh, far more robust engineering terms and also develop techniques by which people could start to experience more clairvoyance and higher awareness just by following quite straightforward procedures. Uh, for example, uh, we have the pleasure here this evening of a, a nice gentleman over there, give everyone a little wave, <laughs> who had the pleasure of working with me today. Uh, he has the advantage in life that he, he certainly had many other lifetimes of doing this kind of work, and I was merely doing a sort of refresher work in this lifetime just to bring him back up to speed with what was already known and adding on a few bits, some improvements in the techniques. Um, and if you have a chat with him, he'd be able to explain to you that within about three, four hours of working together and practicing some out-of-body techniques, uh, he himself was able to experience what it was like to drop into another world and experience an alien body and the different sorts of systems it operates by, because they are energetically a little bit different to us. But if you can match up with them, it's perfectly possible to do. So it's just, you can get confirmation, it's not just one character here saying, I can do it. It's in fact perfectly teachable. Do you teach it? Yes, and that, that's, that's what I mainly do, teach people how to do this. Yes, what about uh, past events where things have happened? And people have built up belief systems around them. I, I, I'm personally not that interested in uh, religious things because often religion requires people to subscribe to doctrines or beliefs. <laughs> it would be yeah. What I personally like to do is work very ex experimentally. It's like, see what I can experience uh, and test it and then see what other people can experience and get their perceptions too. Because everyone in this room here this evening brings a fresh experience to the earth and the things we can experience beyond it. And by getting their different viewpoints as well and trying to copy them, we build up a much bigger picture. It would be awful if we had to draw a line and say some belief sets all our understanding. It's much better to question everything and experiment with it and try your own approaches because through that experimental approach new discoveries emerge whereas people who operate on a belief system often say they're things they have to believe in order to maintain their sense of selves and there are other subjects they're afraid to dabble in. I'll give you a practical example of this one. Uh, in the very much the sort of Christian uh, mindset they would talk about how the lower spirit world it is very dangerous to connect to. And if you connect with them, they will corrupt you and they will muck you about. <laughs> now, I personally know uh, from experience that that is certainly the case. There are a lot of lower spirit forms who, if you're open to them, will try and corrupt your mind and play with you. Uh, for example, many paranoid schizophrenics who I've had the pleasure to help get mucked about by them, thoughts dropped into their heads. If you go around here in Soho, you could probably find some nice pubs with lower spirit forms who specialize in encouraging things like alcoholism. And if they connect to you, they'll make you want to consume drinks. Similarly, if you're looking at someone clairvoyantly who's addicted, you can often see these spirit forms hanging about in their aura. And there they are. And if you treat them nicely, they'll start to let that person go. But it's best not to do battle with them because we have come into their worlds, curiously enough. And this is where belief would get in the way. If the belief says you're not even allowed to look at these beings and discover what they're like and what they're up to, you'll never really learn uh, how, in fact, there's an ongoing interaction with them you can't prevent, because you're a brighter being that's come down into a lower world of these forms, and that gives you much of your human personality, and hence a lot of the vulnerability to their effects that you'll experience. So I hope that's answering a lot of your question. So come on, give me a very short version of it there. Yeah, I mean, maybe more finessing it, like uh, how, if you experience them, they look like an angel. Yeah. Yeah. Experience what? If you saw an angel or something like that, like, and it, was, it came, came as a religious vision, but it was actually 
Yeah. Well, it, yeah. it's the nature of how to distinguish between different spirit forms, the more angelic types, which you can certainly find, more characters who live in other worlds who are visiting, or more lower spirit forms who like to mimic things, uh, such as one day I was working with a character who said uh, he had a lovely actress with him, I think he said Audrey Hepburn in spirit form. And I was looking at this thinking, and it looked more like a gremlin to me. <laughs> so they can spirit forms of different sorts can mimic and play around, but they all have a vibration and they all have a level to them. And if you want a simple litmus test, you can simply test the unconditional love vibration that they work with. And you'll find the very bright beings do it very smoothly, and the lower ones just have a lower vibration tone of it. By taking you to experience a different range of them, it becomes quite obvious what's what. So by just not being limited by belief, but meeting these beings, preferably you've got someone teaching you and helping you do it, you'll soon be able to tell the difference between them. There's no great mystery to it, uh, and anything, any fear of that should be wiped away, because it's fear of this that causes ignorance and ultimately makes you more susceptible. You say it. Is an insight into what other advanced alien worlds are like and a few other less advanced ones. Because most people hear about these other worlds, they hear about alien worlds, but there's very little from the perspective of other beings. We have plenty of visitations to Earth, plenty of people stepping out of flying saucers and saying hello, doing the odd uh, experiment and then clearing off in a hurry, but we get very little insight from their worlds of what their lives are like. Do they live in families? How do they reproduce? What, what are their interests? In some worlds, they are quite interested in music. For example, I found working with the small grey characters, they really loved, uh, if I was ever listening to a bit of human rock and roll, they seemed to like that kind of stuff. Whereas when I was working with their larger, large grey counterparts, less interested in that. <laughs> so we find little anecdotal things like this. This is a book that's designed to give you a sense of these worlds so that when you yourself are doing meditation practice or a bit of astral projection, it's a bit like a phone number. You can look them up and if there's somewhere you feel drawn towards, it helps you get in there and helps you get a sense of how to personally get an experience of their world. Uh, and that will augment your life back here. Not physically. No, my... but spiritually. Well, that's the story of the book. Every yes. single place we've gone to, uh, I and the team of people who I worked with to actually go and do this, have had the experience of going in there. What was it like? Yes. What was the environment like? The, down to simple things. I remember sort of one day we're standing outside an alien being's house and I remember the sort of crunch of a gravelly-like surface walking in. Little details like that cropped yes. up. Uh, and it has to be said as well, uh, alien children found the sort of human apparitions quite fascinating. <laughs> it was like parents saying, now look at these. If you live over there on the slightly primitive planet, yeah. we're not quite completely primitive, it's coming out of primitive, this is what they're like. And demonstrating how our human forms had various limitations we were stepping beyond at the moment. But it was rather like a sort of natural history program in many ways. What is the time frame like? I mean, if you go visit... There are two ways in which this was done. One was working with people, uh, sitting with them, uh, and we were going into the right state of consciousness to make this possible, and then afterwards trying as best as it could to be remembered. So that would be sessions of perhaps two hours when we were doing that until everyone was worn out and your head would start to spin if you tried it anymore. Yeah. In fact, in all, you could probably manage about three or four hours a day of this kind of activity, and that wouldn't even be five days a week. It does affect you. And then there was the writing it out, which is energetically quite tricky to do, because typing is a very low vibration energy, and linking back into these worlds is very high vibration energy, and that puts quite a strain on the body. Uh, and perhaps if sort of 90 minutes a day of in, out, in, out, uh, would be about as much as it could do really usefully on most days. 
So it took quite a long time to actually build it all up, and that's so why it took about two years to develop that book, write it down, ch check a few things, add in a, a couple of last details. So that's giving you some of the time there. Yeah, but then, I mean, you know, even to get to know a person, yeah. you know, even on just a straight interaction, you know, yeah. get some sense or cognizance of that. Probably might take an hour, two hours at least. Yeah. You know, so I'm interested where whether the time frame times go faster than this thing, or you know, it's like how does it comp compare with your experience well, of time in this? Well, there's two, there's another just thing to mention. To pointing out time, it had an odd dynamic constantly found. But in most advanced worlds, time was running at a different speed to it is here. Right. So, the uh, what might be an interaction here that would take place over many years, uh, in another world, in particular, the beings who actually helped strengthen this pathway that made it possible in the first uh, chapter on alien beings, uh, they described that so far, it's still all going on in what equates to their morning. So yeah. like a morning's interaction for them is happening over a much longer time period here. That, that's what I was, yeah. and, and The other thing just to mention about getting to know them is because you're swapping bodies, you're sharing personalities, you get a much more instant knowing of who you're dealing with very fast, which also comes back to the questions about uh, angelic beings or lower spirits masquerading about them. Once you've got the skills of telling the difference between these beings, you get a very fast impression of what they're like, because you're knowing them as you would know yourself in many ways. So it is a very different sort of dynamic to the one we have in normal human interactions. It's like deeply knowing someone in bursts. <laughs> Any more questions? Because I think on videotape time we're getting near the end of what you plan to do. <laughs> I just wonder really? if you've had any experience What's that? of Sirius, any experience with people from Sirius? Sirius, I, in that, as a location, I, I wouldn't know as an obvious one. I might have done it by accident, but I don't have the label to hand. So, uh, dreadful uh, astronomer, that way. Uh, and much as in the book, tried to sort of give a feel of where some of these beings would physically be located, it, it it was a case of realizing my uh, astronomy was wretched and I did not know enough of the star system to put a good stab at it. <laughs> well, that's it. So, any last questions for this evening? Or are we all done? Okay. All right. Well, then, thank you very much for everyone coming by. I do hope you buy some product this evening because it keeps it all going <laughs> and this contributes to feeding my wife and children. <laughs> <laughs> Who we were also met through projection. Who, uh, who said, uh, managed to sort of choose coming through to me before I ever physically got together with them. So we're quite close to the Do they have way. any memory? Sorry? Do they have any compass of memory well, of, of that meeting? My children are still too young to play that one, but they both got a lot of sensitivities. Uh, and in the case of my uh, wife, uh, she she had this sort of vision of her that connected to her physical body when we got together and thus she changed personality enorm enormously and even then uh, rather like you point out a question about guiding spirits are the aspects of you and things like that we recently found in our life we suddenly could pick up a life of a life of being husband and wife in a very parallel looking world that was a bit like German but different, where we were living together, uh, and this was dropped into us very recently, and it had the effect of spicing up our love life quite a bit, because <laughs> we suddenly found these very like lover characters had come through. So if you've been married for, uh, I don't know, since 2004, that's when we were married, 2002 when we got together, because there we are, 2006, so suddenly of a whole load more loving and passion coming through, also with matching memories of living in a slightly Germanic looking parallel world. These are some of the things that still come through today. Uh, and as I said, these are the ones we're supporting and feeding tonight.
So thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. 